So my name is Carly Wannerhide. Um, like I said, I just graduated from UConn in December and I am now working as a design technologist at Greenhouse Studios. Uh, I was also able to work in the LCIZ for three years of, two years of my UConn career, which was just an absolutely wonderful time um, and had the absolute pleasure of working with wonderful women and people and getting to help put together this Women in Making Forum. So as we get started, I'm going to, in a moment, pass on the baton uh, for our panel to go ahead and introduce themselves. Hopefully Dr. Orgy will be joining us. I know she is dealing with a couple things. Um, so if she pops in, that's great. If not, we will be sure to share this experience with her later. Um, as far as how the panel goes, we will be asking questions. If anyone would like to ask a question during the panel as something comes up, um, feel free to message that in the chat and we will unmute you. There will also be time at the end um, that will be specifically for audience Q&A. So if you'd like to hold on to that until that point, that's totally fine, but either one. All right, so with that, um, I'm going to go ahead and pass the baton. Um, to why don't we start with Reina? We would love to hear your introduction um, where you can introduce yourself, talk about your work. Um, and if you have anything to share, that would be wonderful. Um, thank you everybody who helped organize this event. I'm so happy to be here. Um, so just a quick introduction. My name is Reina. I'm a freshman at the University of Connecticut in the School of Engineering. Um, and two things I'm really passionate about is science and entrepreneurship. Um, so almost my entire life I've been working on kind of fusing these two passions of mine to make a real impact. Um, my junior year of high school, I created this device to, well, my sophomore year of high school, I created this device to detect arsenic contaminants in water using these really cool changing photonic uh, crystal structures. And I had a good run in terms of science fairs. I participated um, regionally, nationally, and internationally, but I kind of came to the conclusion that I want to make something that can have a real impact and is scalable. Um, and that's when I realized that that um, for, for science to have a real impact, entrepreneurship needs to be fused amongst that in some way. Um, so my junior year of high school, I said, let's make something more in the engineering in engineering realm so it could be um, more commercialized. And so I created this device to eliminate varroa mite infestations in honey beehives. Um, and varroa mites are like ticks on humans are killing uh, honey bees by the millions each year. Over 60% of bees die simply because of these mites and they're the root cause of colony collapse disorder. So same thing, I um, participated in science fairs regionally. When I was at the Intel International Science and Engineering Fair, a couple of people came by and asked me if this was a product and if they can buy it. Um, at the time, no, it wasn't, but I said yes. And so I quickly had to realize how to make this. Um, and, and that's when um, the entrepreneurship side of me started kicking in. Um, so I started, I got a couple 3D printing labs near me. I have two 3D printers in my home, six 3D printers at my school. Um, and I just started mass producing them and giving it out for testing to beekeepers throughout US and uh, a couple in Europe. And then um, slowly after that, I, um, I, I did that for a bit. And, and there was this article that went viral, which got over 6,000 pre-orders in a matter of two weeks, which is when I kind of realized the, the importance of PR, which is not something I gave importance to before then. Um, and so that's what I've been working on ever since. Unfortunately, my lab closed down um, after COVID hit, so that halted the research process. And that's when I came to the realization that it shouldn't just be beekeepers that have the power to save the bees, but anyone, people like you and I, non beekeepers as well. And so that's when I said, let's go into CPG. So I created this, um, and, and I regret going into beverages every day because I realize how difficult this industry is, um, the more I do it. But I created this um, immune support shot with honeybee byproducts in which a pollinator tree is planted for every bottle sold. This is what it looks like. Um, and I originally was just selling direct to consumer and now we um, are going into retail, particularly Whole Foods, which we look forward to launching in the next two months. Um, and so, a lot of what I do now is just fusing my passion for both science and entrepreneurship to try to make a real impact. So um, thank you again for having me and look forward to hearing from the other panelists as well. Raina, thank you. That sounds like absolutely incredible work. And I'm so excited to hear more about that as we work through these questions. Ankito, would you like to go next? 
let me unmute myself. I was asking me a buttons. <laughs> Uh, yeah, great to be here. Um, I'm Ankita. I'm the co-founder and CFO of a company called Unitex. Um, what we do is we take in video data coming in from drones and sometimes from CCTV cameras, and we analyze them at the edge using deep neural nets, uh, machine learning, deep learning, um, and make easily consumable insights available to our customers um, in a very user-friendly manner through intuitive dashboards and such. Um, that's what we do. And uh, before I jumped into the startup, I was working for the government of India, Ministry of Finance, um, as a, an IRS officer. IRS stands for Indian Revenue Service, just like there's Indian Revenue Service in the US. Um, and um, after a few years of being uh, a bureaucrat, um, I, I felt like there was there was space for some more fulfillment. And I wanted to do something which is a little bit more challenging, a little bit uh, new, so to speak. And uh, that's when I came across um, this, uh, this, this idea of the startup that a few of my um, uh, friends were working on. And uh, they wanted somebody from a legal finance background to come and join the co-founding team. And I said, why not? Um, so that's how the transition from finance into uh, high performance computing and machine learning happened. Don't get me wrong, I still don't code, <laughs> but I take care of a lot of uh, the business side of things and the legal side of things. Also, uh, in my three years at the startup, I have diversified what I know and what I do into intellectual property. Uh, because uh, at the heart of any tech company is, 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 is the intellectual property that, that your team creates. And you have to learn the right tools to identify it, to protect it, and to leverage it in order to uh, uh, make these products available to your clients, but also to um, uh, create moats, economic moats, so to speak, against competition, right? So uh, I... That's what I do right now. I do legal finance, intellectual property. Being a startup co-founder means you're dabbling uh, with a lot of different types of things and you have to constantly keep upskilling yourself. So there is no one title, but uh, it's exciting. It, it keeps you on your toes and that's what I love, love about it. Yeah. Thank you. You're really, you're making your own title is really what you're doing. That's how, <laughs> one way you're a maker. And Ankata is also joining us from Saudi Arabia. Um, we're so excited to have her here too. And I just thought I would mention it. So it's past dinner time for her and she is still getting to join us. And yeah, last but not least, um, I'm going to hand it over to Lisa. I've had the pleasure of working with Lisa this last spring as an undergrad research assistant. So take it away. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and screen share, hopefully. Let's see if this works. <clears throat> share. I think you see that. So um, a little bit first who I am, uh, Lisa Kuhn. I'm a professor at UConn in the biomedical engineering department. And I have my undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering and then a PhD in material science. Then I was a able to do a postdoc with a professor at Case Western Reserve University, and then another one in Boston at the Children's Hospital, um, Harvard Medical School. And I had my first taste of entrepreneurship with him. He uh, was at, right at that point when I came to work with him, uh, he needed someone to help him start this company. And so I was able to, um, and I said, the company was dealing with, with uh, purification of natural bone crystals. And so uh, he had developed a new isolation procedure that retained all the unique structures of what our bone crystals have that, that are lost by everyone else who makes them. They all heat them up to really high temperatures. And so the biological activity of these materials uh, led us to start this company. And uh, thanks to his big name recognition, right? He's a professor at Harvard, um, but he's now passed away actually. But uh, anyways, we were able to sell the company to another uh, smaller company. And that, uh, that success, it was, was awesome. You know, it's really, uh, was a great experience. Uh, but then, uh, it, you know, things you'll, you'll find as you go through your life, sometimes your, your life gets uh, t 
to the forefront. And so for me, I had gotten married and was um, pregnant with my first daughter. So I decided to take a job at UConn. And now I've been there ever since. So, <laughs> and uh, it's, it's been great to be in a university setting where I could continue to follow through on dreams, things that I want to work on that if when you're at a company, you don't get the chance to, to do that. So what I show here is my latest uh, dream that's becoming a reality. The, I call it the Yukon Biosymmetrics Project. And uh, my maker goal is to improve the comfort and confidence and the self-image of breast cancer survivors. I was motivated by a friend of mine who uh, said that she that cancer was, was bad, but what was really bothering her was the fact that she couldn't get anything to wear in her bra that wouldn't pop out or was hot or uncomfortable. And, and I had just been on a visiting professorship in France where I was able to um, learn all about 3D bioprinting. I'll tell you what that kind of bioprinting is or that 3D printing is in a moment, but uh, um, the uh, I, I was just, filled with these new ideas about what I'd be able to make. So sorry, I see my internet connect my video screen. Early want her hide. Uh, if, if I would not be where I am had it not been for her um, helping me get this project started. Don't mind the dogs barking in the background. My husband just got home and uh, they're gonna bark for a moment. Um, I can attempt to make it quieter, but I don't know how to make it quieter. Okay, um, so I also wanna acknowledge the, the cancer doc here, um, Dr. Christina Stevenson, who, when I told her about my idea, she was very supportive and gave me some seed money to be able to buy some supplies. And uh, um, now I've got some biomedical engineering students doing their senior design project with me that I list there. So what is the, um, the project? Let me just get to it here. Uh, bioprinting is something that you'll see also in the food industry making big leaps forward because it's it works basically like a frosting bag in that there's a gel like material that's extruded out and you can make all kinds of patterns with it. So I was thinking let's make uh, breast prostheses using a soft gel material that'll be nice and porous and could look pretty and um, could be customized because I've been able to this is kind of the right time to do it. The technology for scanning has, 3D scanning has come down and become simple and affordable. The, um, these bioprinters are not simple and affordable, but I was able to uh, get money from the Connecticut Breast Health Initiative and also uh, with matching funds from the School of Engineering to buy this $100,000 machine that's in the background here. So it's a, a fancy frosting spreader <laughs> that can really make very fine uh, deline, uh, delineated uh, tubes of material that then harden, um, giving rise to the structure. Um, so basically we're taking scanning scans, 3D images like this of a woman, her mastectomy side, and the shape that she wants to have over on the other side of her body. And using this uh, software, uh, ScanX, we can then use another program called Mesh Mixer. And thanks to Carly, who figured out how to use that, we uh, can come up with a file that if you 3D printed would look, 3D printed using traditional methods would look like what's here on the bottom right hand side. I think you can see my arrow. But instead, we're building it up, extruding uh, silicone and we're working out what are the best patterns right now, but it's kind of a porous honeycomb like thing. I'm thinking of uh, talking about bees and uh, um, honeycomb, whatever. <laughs> Think of that, it's similar in some ways. And then here's the patient wearing one of these, uh, our, our first one that's perhaps a little bit too hard and not so comfortable yet. But anyways, you really can't tell the difference when she puts it in her bra there. And, uh, and she's so happy that someone cares enough to do something for her. And that's what keeps motivating me. I have five women on Monday that I'm going to get to scan and then start making uh, the new ones because I now have the machine. And um, I think that's my last um, last slide there. So anyway, so let's get to our questions. But thank you for having me here today. And I'm really glad to hear about all these uh, cool stuff that other women are doing as well. Thank you, Lisa. And I was just let know that uh, Dr. Orji, you have perfect timing and you get to jump in right now and give yourself a quick introduction. Um, so without further ado. Hi everyone. Uh, uh, 
Oh, no. I went to my computer to join. So I'm happy to be here and thank you for this opportunity. Can you hear me, Claire? Yep. Okay. Okay. My name is uh, uh, Rita Oji, and I'm a computer science professor here at the Housing University, Canada. So the houses in the Atlantic, uh, Canada, very close to Boston. So what I do is that in my research, I kind of try to, okay, let me start by saying, okay, I am the director of a persuasive computing lab and also a Canada researcher on persuasive technology. So my lab is uh, apparently a big one. I tend to have between 25 to 30 students, depending on when you come. Graduate student. Over the summer, we have a couple of grad coming in to our lab, so that might make us a bit bigger. And the one thing I pride about in my lab is that we have a very, it's a very diverse lab. We tend to call it the United Nations of uh, the university because uh, I think the last time I checked, I have people from 13 different countries represented in my lab. And uh, at any point in time, uh, by some stroke of luck or conscious self-worth, I tend to have women on the majority. 60% of my uh, lab members seems to be women, which is very, very high compared to 20% or 15% that you get in field like my computer science, where we still see it as a male dominated field. So I am happy for that. And beyond that, I think the majority of my students are minorities in one way or the other, either they are black or the white. I have, uh, I mean, uh, but in all, what I'm so happy about is that everybody in my life feel a sense of belonging. People say, tell me how well I'm doing. I kind of indirectly tell them or directly tell them that it's not actually about me alone it's the power of the people i have in my lab i have i'm really very fortunate to work with those amazing students so uh what do we do let me tell you a bit of what we do when you hear about persuasive technology it's all about trying to see how we can design interactive technologies to help people achieve various objectives that are important to them. It is also called behavior change systems, right? It's a research within the human computer interaction. So uh, within that research, uh, the, the beauty of it is that it seems it lent itself to an interdisciplinary area, right? We tend to work on a lot on health and wellness. Like I have a research going on right now in the area of COVID. I've had four research tracks going on in that area. I have research in mental health, I have one in anxiety. We're also working with people from pain. We have, they just think of any health and when we have worked in sexual, related, sexual, sexual behaviors, we work in smoking, cessation, healthy eating, physical activity, just things along that line. One of my students also works in environmental sustainability, all that works in business. So uh, uh, that's what we do. But the, the whole premise that during all our research is that we try to see how do we actually use technology to help people, to empower people, to achieve objectives. And we tend to say that one size does not fit all. So we, we try to see how do we employ the user-centered design that actually position people at the center of the design to tailor our design to various groups. I'm also so passionate about designing for underserved population. I, think, I tend to do a lot of research in Africa because I think that these are people that people don't necessarily think about when most designers are designing what their systems. And for me, I think it is important to get all the voices represented in design. And that's what we do. And um, I am happy to answer any question. If, you, if you're interested in anything I do, research otherwise, you can actually uh, ask me question after this, but let me not take much of your time. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm so looking forward to hearing more about your design process and that human-centered aspect. So important, especially with representation. That's how we're really going to move forward. And so I guess that leads me into my first panel question. Um, and maybe Ankita, we can start with you. But what do you see as the future of global making? Well, I think more and more when it comes to innovation and entrepreneurship and creating, innovation, I think one good thing which is happening right now at the moment is it's getting more distributed, 
right? In the sense, um, we, all of us know that um, the Silicon Valley is where the magic happened. Um, that has the highest concentration of most successful startups. Uh, that's where um, the whole, the, the, I, to make something scale, it's much easier if you're there. So all these things have been true and they are still true to some extent, but now what's happening more and more is there are pockets of entrepreneurship and creation and making that are popping up all over the world, right? In different, in different parts, in different um, geographies. Maybe COVID um, accelerated that a little bit, but I think the trend was already there. Um, the trend was already there. And even on part of investors, the inertia that they had in investing in startups outside their zip code, so to speak, that has gone down. So they are, they are more open-minded, they are more engaging with startups um, happening in different parts of the world. And uh, that I think is a huge advantage, right? Uh, because what happens if you privilege one geography or one if you restrict it, if you reduce it to that particular area, then you miss out on a lot of cool things that a lot of people are doing in other parts of the world. And not everybody has to sort of aggregate in that one um, zip code to, to be innovative, right? So that is a good trend um, that's, that's going on. This, if I had to identify probably one more um, is the seamlessness in um, creativity, so to speak. So working from home, rather than a work-life balance kind of thing, we are moving more towards a work-life integration, um, which, is a, which is something people are thinking a lot more about after COVID, of course. But uh, that's another thing that personally interests me a lot. Definitely, and you brought up a great point about this kind of acceptance and movement towards working across different fields and being creative, um, which I it, think is so exciting. I'm an artist myself and getting to work on more of a biology standpoint with Dr. Kuhn was just so exciting. And so maybe Dr. Kuhn, we'd love to hear your thoughts on the future of global making. Well, one thing I think we can do with uh, making is uh, address women's health needs. And uh, for me, what I have seen is that um, kind of at the same time I was having this idea to help my friend, other people around the world are also doing it. And I think this is so cool. So there's, I've, I've been scanning the web to find out who else, who these people are, but there are two women that were in an engineering class in England and they've started a company called Boost and they're making a whole different type of a bra prosthesis or breast prosthesis as well. It's, um, there's a different, we're not all doing the same, you know, we're not using all the same technology. So each of us can kind of thrive and provide this possible solution in parallel. I just saw there's a, a woman in Mexico, um, New Zealand, uh, a, a woman there, breast cancer survivors are saying, okay, yeah, give me this technology and it's accessible now. And so I'm really excited about uh, the chance to kind of bring up women's uh, health issues and solutions for them with, uh, going forward in a global way. Absolutely. And almost to Dr. Ordu's point prior, where you get to hear all these different voices and perspectives of people from all over the world that ultimately give us the best options and women specifically in this case, the best options. Um, so maybe Dr. Orji, then I would love to hear your thoughts on the future of global making. Oh, except you're muted. Okay. Okay. Sorry. For me, I do think that the future of global making actually would lie at the intersection of separating making, like separating development from design. So why do I say that? And in my process of doing my research, I came across a lot of things that actually intrigued me. You know, when we are designing, we get people involved in our design. There was an occasion where I had to work with elder, elderly adults, people above 70. And here we probably would assume that these people don't know anything about technology, right? But because of the type of research we do, we got them involved and taught them what is called design probe, design workshop. 
and eventually allow them to design their artifact. How do they want their communication tool to be like? So it amazed me the kind of ingenuity, the idea that those people in bottles in them. So I wouldn't have imagined that as a designer, as a developer, I wouldn't have imagined that myself. So eventually, over the course of weeks, we were able to come up with a design. They were able to come up with a, with a, with a very complete and fascinating design, which we eventually implemented. So why do I see uh, this as a very important thing is that I do think that everyone has got a voice. And these voices shouldn't be limited by your ability to read or write, write or learn how to design or learn a particular programming language. There should be a framework to harness these ideas, get it out of people. That actually is the way forward where everybody can do anything. My grandmother at home can actually come up with an idea, have come some kind of framework to use to illustrate those ideas and put it together. And someone who is a developer, who is a, uh, 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 the engineer or the computer said, takes that idea and build it up into a product. So when I see, uh, think of Arduino, think of uh, some of the frameworks that are coming up right now that allows those people that are not core coders to actually get involved in design. And I, I can bet you that most of the best designers in the world are not tech, tech people. Some tech people are good at take the instruction and implement it. But I imagine a world where we can get these ideas from different people and do not limit them because they are not literate. Don't limit them because they do not know how to code. Don't limit them because they are not engineers. So I'm looking at a world where the, the, the making space is broadened. The tech space is broadened to mean a lot of things to accommodate people of diverse skills and ideas. And I think that is where the world should be going to at this moment. Think about this uh, coronavirus have happened, right? And then there's going to be a lot of ideas. I'm already in this space. We're trying to come up with ideas, both people working to make sense of what we have gone through, and people that are working to provide solutions to avoid future of catastrophe that might be resulting from this, right? And this is regional. Somehow, there's some kind of regional experiences that are happening, right? The way someone in Africa experienced it is different from the way someone in the United States experienced it. And to tell me that someone in the United States would have to come up with a, with a solution that would work for someone in Africa, it's not going to be feasible because there's a differential experience. There's a differential solution that would happen. How about we empower those? villagers, those illiterate people, to be able to actually think about their own problem and suggest solutions. And then someone who is more equipped do it. So I do think that that is actually where the making space is going on with. With the kind of research we do where people that don't even know anything about technology that probably are not literate, you teach them in one or two sections about design and they pick it up and begin to draw something and tell you how they think this should work. And this is something you wouldn't have thought. So I do think that that is where the future is going to. And I also do think that the making space is gonna shift from being something that is so attached to education to something that is attached to need, attached to problems in the world. So that basically means whether you're in school or not, you can actually be where you are and begin to think about how do I design something to solve problem? That would be it for me. Oh, I got chills thinking about and hearing you talk about creating an infrastructure where everyone gets to join their voices to solve these problems. Um, and also, it's it's so true what you brought up that making, originally it wasn't in education, that wasn't the original intent. Everyone was making in order to survive and prosper. And now to move back towards that and help bunches of people again is really exciting. So. Raina, I know you are also right at the intersection of design uh, and, and, and letting things out into the world and sharing them. So I would love to hear your thoughts on the future of global making. Yeah, um, first, it was so interesting hearing all the different perspectives. And one thing I've written in particular that I, going after Rita, um, what I thought was so inspiring is when she said that you, you should not inhibit somebody's ability or undermine them if they're illiterate, if they, because of their background or whatever the case may be. Um, goal making is such a broad term. So I, I have to say that I think the, the 
the most people, the most creative people, the most um, and people who can have the most impact are just like Lita said, not necessarily the ones who have the best technical background. I always say that they're kids. Um, I feel like children have always had the most creativity, the curiosity, the ingenuity and the energy needed to, to make a difference um, and carry that along. So I think one thing I, I, I just wanted to point out and say is similar to what Rita said, is never undermine a child's potential. Um, in fact, if, if I had the opportunity, I would probably hire children over um, <laughs> over an adult, even though I'm not allowed to, um, and, and I can't. But I that because I know that the creativity they bring to the table is unmatched by any other person, and so to kind of keep that curiosity and that light, that fire, that small, that small fire in every single kid to never undermine them and to cultivate that curiosity that's just inherently present. And the second point I just want to make really quickly is um, I think recognizing the similar to what Ankita was saying, recognizing the difference between diversity um, in just in terms of race and religion and diversity of thought. Um, and I think the former one is is so much more powerful um, because oftentimes we think diversity is rooted in our skin color, is rooted in our language, is rooted in the culture we've brought up in or in the environment that we've been used to. But I do believe that a lot of it comes from um, our thinking process, which of course is influenced by our race, by our culture, by our environment. But um, to, to kind of change, instead of just trying to, you know, fill this quota, fill, fill a quota for the diversity of thought, um, whether it be curiosity, creativity, ingenuity, ingenuity or making. Um, I, I, think, I think that's where the future is heading, or at least I hope, <laughs> I hope it is. Absolutely. And I love hearing you talk about the ingenuity and, and imagination of kids and holding on to that. Because I often, if I'm, if I'm facing a problem, I, I think, okay, if I was six, how would I handle this? Um, because you watch them, you give them a piece of paper and say, draw a lion, and they're going to charge head on it, whatever they think a lion is. So speaking of drawing, this is my little, my little yeah, segue. It's, it's interesting that you say that, actually, because I always say that um, when you don't know what you can't do, you do it anyway. And I feel like children, because they're so inexperienced, it always benefits them in a certain way. And so um, similar to you said that, like, if you ask a child to draw a line, he'll, he'll give you something completely different, which is exactly what we need today. Absolutely. Um, so Nashua asks, how do you get, or Nashua, if you would like to actually unmute and ask this question, you are more than welcome to. Um, if not, I'm happy to do that too, but All right, I'll go ahead and ask. Oh, oh sorry. sorry, go ahead, no, go. <laughs> um, so my question was um, for everyone. Uh, how do you get people to take you seriously, especially as a woman and or person of color, and especially when you initially start out your projects? Great question, thank you. I can take that if that's okay. Cool. Okay. Um, very, very interesting question, actually. And I, the moment uh, you asked about how do you make people take you seriously, I was like, I have to take this question because I'm a woman doing business in Saudi Arabia. So <laughs> I'm well placed to answer um, because this is something I constantly find myself thinking about, right? Um, Saudi Arabia is not exactly known for a lot of women um, in leadership, leadership positions. I mean, heck, we, the legislation allowing women to drive just came into being like a year ago, right? Lucky for me, I live in a township where I could still drive even before the legislation. <laughs> it's a free zone, but that apart, um, the image of the country as not being very, let's say, encouraging of women entrepreneurs is, is not something which is hidden from the world. So that being said, when we started a deep tech startup um, in Saudi Arabia, and I was one of the co-founders, a lot of the times we would be in meetings and I have actually faced a situation, to me, it was funny in the beginning, right? Where people don't look you eye to eye when they're talking to you. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a very subtle thing, right? Um, they would be addressing you, but 
there's that there's that disconnect right and how and you have to be i mean i've always been empathetic to that i'm i'm not trying to say that um it's in any way any kind of disrespect towards me right it's simply because they're just not used to it they're just not used to uh, sitting across a woman um across the table and talking as um as as fellow leaders right so to speak so how do we the question is how do how do you how do you bridge that gap and how do you um position yourself as an equal but also um empathize with them and make them feel comfortable so that you're able to then um appeal to their sense of individuality and then have a meaningful conversation right that's the whole idea um i do that by first of all preparing really well before meetings <laughs> so that i don't have to think about the the technical stuff and all my focus is on on exercising empathy and being able to uh, connect with the person right those aspects so i i work hard and i uh, i make sure that i have examined the issue from all sorts of angles that i've done my research that i have a couple of alternatives um by way of outcomes that i want from the meeting or that we want that's good for both parties from the meeting so that we can then fluidly talk about them and then arrive at a middle ground which works for both i mean i do a lot of negotiations for unitex as well um so when you are negotiating as a woman with an arab businessman you've got to you've got to really try hard to make that connection because otherwise if you're not speaking the same language you will never arrive at an outcome which is equally uh, good for both parties right um and my intention going in is how do i make this deal work for unitex but also for the other person uh, that's that's my goal so um i'm sorry was it nashwa yeah so nashwa to answer your question prepare really well before any conversation that's important to you um right and also about being a woman of color about a, i'm i'm a brown woman I, i come from india um that also plays a part we have to we have to identify these things so that we can start dealing with them right because every fact um about your background about your culture about where you're coming from is 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 playing a part in the dynamics of that conversation so you have to be aware of it right so that you can then take that into account and then come up with an approach which is going to be a productive one for the purposes of what your goal is um so yeah prepare really well and uh treat yourself as an equal to the other person i think that's that's the two things Ankita, thank you for sharing your experiences and that information. I certainly am taking a lot from that. Um, would anyone else like to answer that question before we move on? Yeah, probably. Uh, let me uh, share a, a bit of an idea from the academic point of view. You know, I think I I found myself in a space where I'm either going to be the youngest, or I'm going to be the only woman, or the only black stuff like that. and naturally you know in academia <clears> on <throat> as a person i'm not that serious type i would laugh i would make a lot of things that make people even think that this girl can never be serious in life she's not supposed to be here you know uh, so initially when i i start doing do my phd people were believing i was going to change so i try to be serious but i, I i'm not created like that so it, it was more like trying to fit into someone else's shoe I was struggling with it so at the time I said no what but they just shouldn't take me seriously that is fine but the result would actually force them to take me serious you know uh, one thing that I tend to advise people do not think don't try to be who you are not in this space especially if you are in stem you will struggle through it so at the time the moment i said i'm going to just be who exactly i am i don't care if i want to laugh i would just laugh i might be saying it and be laughing people might be saying oh, but you know it might make a lot of sense so people were doubting all those initial days and stuff like that when i said it doesn't matter whether they doubt or not but the results would tell them that i am serious 
uh, at the point I started and then results started showing itself. You know, that's when people begin to know that this is a serious person as an, even when I don't want to talk, they will kind of want to seek what is your opinion, Rita? I might just be laughing out to you. What is your opinion, Rita, right? And that goes back to what Ankita said, preparing very well. Uh, it's unfortunate that being a minority in, a, in whichever space you find yourself, you all often tend to work more than every other person before you, you be recognized. So that basically means for other things that people would take lightly, you are not gonna do that. You're gonna prepare because you know that any mistake you make, people are gonna capitalize on it and undermine you even for that. That actually prepares me because I know, okay, they're not taking me serious. I'm gonna make them take me serious by action. And I believe in action that was. I might not tell you anything, but the moment you see that the, the, the results are coming out, it really makes people take you serious more than you, uh, you are, more than you can even imagine. It's not like your personality have changed. It's just like you have shown them that you've got a lot to offer. So that comes back to prepare, try to differentiate yourself. Don't, don't, I would always tell people, don't try to fit in. Don't fit in, it doesn't work. Fitting in will actually make you to be a mediocre, would be a subset of people that are already what you're trying to imitate. Just be yourself, do your best as yourself. And in that way, you differentiate yourself from every other person and you show that you are capable even being who you are and people will begin to recognize you and take you serious. And taking you serious is not because your personality have changed, but because they have seen that you've got a lot to offer. So, but I would say initially in, in summary, do not bother whether they take you serious or not. They're gonna start by not taking you serious. Laugh over it. I tend to tell my people, these people should wait. They're gonna see who I am exactly. You know, in a moment, they're going to see exactly who you are if you're doing your homework very well. And that taking serious will automatically come without you doing anything or fighting about it. Do not fight about it. Counter it with your results, with your action. People will automatically begin to change and see what you can do. That's so true. It's so incredibly empowering to be your most authentic self. And while that can be hard, it truly is one of those things that will guide Is everybody having a bit of trouble hearing me? Yeah, I think I think the network. <laughs> I think. Oh, can you hear me now? now? Yeah. <laughs> you're right. Oh, thank you for pointing that out. I just actually got a notification that my internet connection is unstable. So hopefully that stays. Um, but it made me think when my my when I was young, my mom said to me, "Carly, men have this ability where they get to prove their incompetence. They're automatically seem competent, and men and women." have to prove their confidence. And that's something that I've carried with me and in going into a situation and remembering that and, you know, proving that as difficult as it is, um, has stuck with me. All right, I'm gonna move on to the next question just for the sake of time. And I see so many awesome questions in the chat. Um, okay, let's see. So one question from the LCIZ is if there are any female makers who inspired you to do what you do or any female makers that currently inspire you? Take that question. Um, so I think, um, I know this is like so cliche, but, but definitely my mom is one of them. And um, second, um, Amelia Earhart is, has always been, um, I mean, I have a poster of her on, on my, uh, while I've always looked up to her. Um, and and um, something I've, I think I've, I've learned from them is some, similar to what Ankita said last time is um, that they were, they, they knew their worth and they never backed down for it. Um, I think the, the biggest thing that, you know, when um, I used to go, um, I, I saw my mom and my parents grow up from where they were in India to where they are now. And I always valued that. And I think that is like a very innovative and maker thing to do in it. So um, one thing that they always told me is to know your worth. And that's something that I've learned from looking up to role models like Amelia Earhart, um, who have been a pioneer for women for decades now. And their legacy has lasted and transcended long before they passed. Um, one thing, I'll just keep it 
really short. One thing that um, I, I remember when I, I was going, doing, attending these science conferences as, as a guest um, throughout uh, US when I was participating, participating in science fairs. And um, similar to a lot of these women who are speaking here today, I was a 17 year old woman of color, I came from India, looked different, acted different. Um, and so like a, a six hour conference call would pass by and the only two words I would say is goodbye <laughs> at the end of the call. Um, it, it came to a point where I, I had this self realization, self talk with myself and I, and I realized um, that, that my mom and my dad did not raise me for 17 years to stay silent in a six hour conference call. And I, I started forcing myself to speak up um, even when I was uncomfortable. And um, I, I think that that was the biggest thing and something that even if it didn't make sense, I would talk um, and slowly and slowly. I mean, it was difficult, but even if one like saying one sentence would make my heart beat out of my chest. And I think I've, I've learned growing up to never to know my worth and never silence myself. And that's something I've learned from looking at female leaders like my mom, like Amelia Earhart um, and and seeing them as as a role model um, for me and, and, and so many other young women. So definitely, definitely to, to know your worth and challenge yourself every day. I always really say I was, I was the most average kid ever. I was more average than the average kid was. I was never good at school, but I never sucked. I didn't have lots of friends, but I wasn't a complete loser. That may be not true, but I was a I was a very I was a very average kid, and it was only by forcing myself and taking risks day by day, doing things I was uncomfortable with that I was okay with, um, valuing myself equal to my male counterpart. So um, definitely Amelia Earhart, and definitely my mom. Wow, that's so listening to that incredibly inspiring, and especially forcing yourself to talk. And it makes me think about this idea of you have to practice being the person you want to be eventually. And that doesn't mean all the time, but putting yourself out there and being uncomfortable to practice making that natural. So important. Um, Lisa, also thank you for your answer in the chat um, from Maddie M's question about overcoming imposter syndrome. Um, and Lisa says to overcome imposter syndrome, it's good to keep connected to a group of people that will build up your self-confidence and remind you of your self-worth. Um, and thank you, Uche, as well. Lisa, I, I'm sorry, I just talked for you. Um, but I would love to hear, and, and maybe we can start with Lisa, is what advice do you have for young women entering your field of study? Okay, that one's always a tough one because each person's a little different, right? So, so I, I, but uh, we, we've been hearing about, uh, uh, already I think answered that question in some ways, right? Where you you realize, you, you have to realize you can be yourself and uh, that um, it, you know who you are inside. And sometimes it's a little hard to, it says my internet connection's unstable, but hopefully you can keep hearing me. Um, anyways, uh, the uh, I guess the advice I would say is that, um, also, when you're confronted with the people that are going to try to steal your work or the, you know, the haters, like we had a little Taylor Swift at the beginning here, right? Um, and going back to that, when you, when you have those people that are haters, you know, you, you do just have to kind of have a um, like water off a duck's back kind of response to it. You can't let that in all the time, right? You just have to have a little bit of a, a kind of mail or some, you know, protective clothing, whatever it is you want to say, because you're going to get some hits. Um, so because of going into a field that can be male dominated or um, like mine being an, an engineer, it just happens. So um, fortunately, um, I, I would say too, if you are somebody who is an immigrant, uh, you're going to have a better chance of succeeding because I know myself, I am, and I feel like that really motivated me. Like the whole attitude within my family was like, yep, we are moving up. We are getting out. We are, we're going to do something better. And so, uh, if, um, uh, and, and so stay around those people, try to connect like we are connecting here today uh, with others that are gonna help you help you do that. Thank you. So as we're getting close to ending, um, one of my favorite questions to ask is, what is your favorite thing about being a maker who identifies as a woman? 
and I would love to hear from everyone quickly because I know we're running out of time, but um, whoever wants to share out. Um, I think for me, um, identifying as a woman has always given me power. And, and that's something that it's a value I've been raised with similar to what Lisa was saying. I've been grown up with immigrant parents who have came out of the harshest conditions and seeing them now today, um, I think they've, they've raised values in me of self-respect, some things that they had to go through that they had to build themselves and they wanted to see in their children as well. So, um, and, and like women have the ability to do such powerful things like giving birth to a child, like that is the most magical thing ever. And um, it's so undermined and it's just not given the value that it's supposed to. And if, you know, if, if I were asked, you know, what, what do you want your superpower to be, which is something I've been asked before by little kids. I always say my superpower is being a woman. I've gotten so many, um, I, I've learned through, through, even through all the difficulties and challenges I've been by being a woman, it's gained in me this confidence of, self-respect of knowing your self-worth and never valuing yourself lower than your male counterpart. Um, so, I mean, it, it gives me power more than anything else in this world. Thank you. I, I can go next. Uh, I think uh, being a woman is how it's a strength to me, clearly, because um, I feel stronger in my identity, um, which is specific to the identity of being a woman. Um, but how, right? I think being a woman, I most of the people I interact with are clearly men. Statistics, right? In entrepreneurship, chances of you doing getting into business with um, a person, uh, chances are that person is going to be a male. And that those repeated encounters made me aware of how I think differently, right? Because um, when you when you get into different kind of types of conversations, but at the other on the other side of the table is always a man, then over time you start realizing there's something different going on here in the dynamics, right? There's something there's something different, and that awareness, if you ponder over that, and if you try to really really dig deep and find out how it, you are different, you will actually realize what your true strengths are. Right. For instance, um, earlier I said when I walk into a negotiation, I work really hard beforehand on the technicalities so that I can focus on the empathy and finding that connection with that person so that we can have a productive dialogue. And I think not a lot of men do that. Right. And that's not a weakness. That's just difference. Right. They think differently. And we the way we think is just naturally different and there's strength in diversity, right? One is not better than the other, but there's strength in diversity because when people who think differently are brought to a table to come up with a solution to any problem, I think that solution would be a far better solution if there is, if the crowd is diverse sitting around the table, right? Um, and that was a huge realization for me because then what happened was once I realized this, that I'm different and that's my strength and that's my strength in these ways, then it gave me like a boost of confidence because now I'm not trying to conform. I'm not trying to, um, I'm not trying to meet the other person where they are at, but I'm using my uniqueness to create a new place, a new ground where both of us can meet and have a more interesting, more engaging conversation than just trying to be like one another. You know what I mean? Um, and that's very liberating because then you start having fun in your work because you're just being yourself, right? And that's, that's when you kick ass. I'm sorry about the language. Now we love it. <laughs> <laughs> that's when it becomes fun. And when you're having fun, um, you work better, I guess. So um, self-awareness is my, is my biggest gift to myself as a woman. Thank you. Dr. Orji, did you want to add anything into this? Her, I don't know if her internet connection is great, but. Um, 
well, if she shows up, we will ask her the question. Um, but Lisa, I, I know you, um, thank you for adding that in the chat. And if you wanted to, you know, add anything else or say anything, that'd be great too. No, I know we're short on time. So I want to help to give room for the other people or other questions. Um, so no. Awesome. Well, I, I just want to read out what Lisa said, because I think it's so important, um, just in case, but She's glad to be a woman maker because she can work on women's health issues in a woman to woman way, which makes the patients feel comfortable and able to share what they really want. I can hear their needs in an empathetic way and relate to them. And this, just reading that and listening to all these speakers just makes me so grateful to be a woman in this field and have the connections that we do have with other women, especially. Thank you so much to all our panelists and all of you attending. Um, this was an absolutely lovely panel and I had such a great time moderating. Uh, and please enjoy the rest of the Skillshares today.